Sitting somewhere in between the Mummy animated series and the Jumanji animated series on the I maybe knew this existed at one point in my life but certainly haven't thought about it in 15 years scale, the Back to the Future animated series is a somewhat expectedly cheap imitation of the cultural phenomenon it's piggybacking off. And because I'm not a fake fan I actually have this cheap imitation on DVD so it's time to put on my Back to the Future Part 2 cap that I purchased for $60 at a convention only to later find out they sell for like 20 bucks online and jump right into it. My name is AJ and this is the mystifying pop cultural oddity that is Back to the Future the animated series. Running for two seasons and a total of 26 episodes from 1991 to 1992, the cartoon detailed the further adventures of Marty McFly. Looks like Doc's new invention just saved him a hundred bucks. Doc Brown. I've used up 99.99% of my brain power. And the extended Brown family. Hi Einstein. As they time travel to different periods, go on zany adventures, and more often than not encounter a distant relative of Biff Tannen. Everything's uh, a all right. The only returning cast members from the films were Mary Steenburgen who returned to voice Clara and Thomas F. Wilson who returned to voice Biff and his relatives. I got one for you. What did the Black Knight say when the medieval slave got stuck up in a tree? Surf's up! <laughs> oh, ow! There's also Christopher Lloyd who returned to play Doc in the live action segments which opened and closed each episode. I think I overextended myself this time. Good thing this is a stretched DeLorean. At any rate, I'll see you in the future! These live action segments also starred Bill Nye the Science Guy, who would conduct an experiment that Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown would narrate, as to sort of turn the show into somewhat of an educational thing. These segments also marked Bill Nye's first ever TV appearance on a nationally broadcast show and directly led him to getting his own series, meaning Bill Nye the Science Guy is technically a spin-off to Back to the Future. While the bulk of the episodes were written and directed by a bunch of guns for hire, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale, the minds behind the Back to the Future films, did serve as executive producers. And Gale directed the live action sequences in season 2. In season 1, these live action sequences were directed by Peyton Reed, the guy who directed Ant-Man, and Ant-Man and the Wasp, and Bring It On. All three of which are movies I have covered on my podcast, which you can find the link to in the description of this video. Despite involvement from Rob and Bob, the series is deemed not canon, so saith Bob Gale, presumably because he, like the rest of us, realised that the show is not very good. It's like a shitty magic school bus or a bizarro version of Rick and Morty even though Rick and Morty is supposed to be a bizarro Back to the Future. This is a shame because something like Back to the Future you would think would actually lend itself quite well to the Saturday morning cartoon format and while watching the characters go to different time periods each episode scratches some kind of itch for those who want to see Doc Brown and Marty go on more time travelling adventures together ultimately the show is either really dull, really uninspired and occasionally really f***ing weird. One of the main areas in which the show is lacking is its characters. Often taking centre stage over Doc or Marty in the series are Jules and Vern, Doc and Clara's kids, who are ostensibly completely original characters to the TV show as they weren't exactly fleshed out in their one scene from the films. What are you, what are you doing here? What is this? Boy are they fleshed out in the series though. Jules is a poncy little nerd and it feels like he's written by someone who isn't smart enough to know how to write a smart character. He does things like call Marty Martin because that means he's intelligent, you know. Martin, are you able to walk a straight line? That kind of stuff. Vern is just an obnoxious little shit who creates the central problem for a lot of the episodes. I'm not too little to drive the DeLorean. <sighs> Doc in the cartoon is voiced by Dan Castellaneta, who is of course mainly known for playing Homer Simpson as well as a whole bunch of other Simpsons characters. And he also replaced Robin Williams as the genie in The Return of Jafar and the Aladdin TV series. For the most part, Castellaneta does a good job at a Christopher Lloyd impression. I know how you feel, Vernie. Oh, oh. He kind of sounds like what Doc Brown would sound like if he was a cartoon character, which, of you know, he is. The most egregious change to Doc Brown's character though is the very forced catchphrases the show makes him deliver. You've got your Great Scott moments. Great Scott! And I guess I can tolerate jumping gigawatts. Jumping gigawatts! But whenever the character gets hurt or whatever he'll cry out, Oucha Magoucha. Oucha Magoucha! Oucha Magoucha! Oucha Magoucha! Oucha Magoucha! Oucha Magoucha! 
The writers clearly felt this would catch on too, because in one episode, someone says Oucha McGoucha to a younger version of Doc, which he likes the sound of, thus making it the origin of this classic catchphrase. Oucha McGoucha! Peculiar expression of discomfort, although it has a nice ring to it. Oucha McGoucha is such a minimal effort catchphrase. It would have literally taken someone three seconds to think of it. I hate it, it sucks. The unforgivable sin of the series is its treatment of Marty McFly. One of, if not the greatest protagonists of all time, is reduced to a horny dumbass. Oh baby, have mercy, ow! No, I'm taking a French class, and I'm flunking. Oh, I wouldn't mind hanging out with some of those foxy French frowlines. Oh, I agree, Doc. Totally awesome. Gone is his quick thinking and problem solving skills. Now he's a comically stupid character who worst of all isn't very loyal to Jennifer, the woman he knows for a fact he's going to marry one day. Although I guess the future isn't written yet, so Marty can feel free to wreck his love life. Because whenever he travels to a new time period he'll try to get his frick on with like a 13th century woman. Or a dinosaur. I'm just kidding about the dinosaur, but honestly that's not actually that far away from what the show would try and attempt. Whether or not Marty and Jennifer are actually together depends on the episode and whether or not she's in it, which reduces their once time-spanning love story to more of a casual will they won't they. While Mary Steenburgen's performance as Clara is fine, it's mostly relegated to the background, but Thomas F. Wilson as Biff and all his relatives are probably the highlight of the series. Hey, I'm not buying any defected merchandise. I want my money back. He sounds like he's having fun playing characters like General Beauregard Tannen or Lord Biffingham. Quiet! When she should be seen and not heard, lady. But in a weird moment of art direction, the Biff of present day is the wrong character design. He should be the older, emasculated Biff from the 80s, but instead he's an animated version of the 1950s design of the character. This goes under the radar because we never see him interact with George or Lorraine, who actually aren't featured in the series, presumably because of the Crispin Glover likeness fiasco. Outside of the main cast, though, the background character designs are really weird. A lot of them don't fit into the house style at all. They look like they were drawn by completely different artists to the main roles. And you even get weird cases like in season 1 episode 5 Roman Holiday aka Swing Low Sweet Chariot Race where one of the Roman rulers is like blue and fuzzy. What is, what's going on here? The weirdness extends past the character designs though and well into the troubling creative directions regarding the plots of different episodes. For example, the first episode of the whole show has Jules and Vern time travelling back to the 1860s and accidentally joining opposite sides of the Civil War, with Marty and Doc trying to save them from getting killed. So that's how in the first episode of the Back to the Future animated series we get to see Marty McFly fighting to keep slavery. If you were tasked with making a fourth Back to the Future adventure, surely as a writer and presumably fan of the trilogy, the first creative decision you would make, the first central question you would ask would be, what time period do they travel to? And this is a weird choice. We aren't eased into the show's episodic format with something more distinctly recognisable like medieval times or the pirate days. Instead we're thrust straight into the civil war. The worst episodes of the show though are the ones that don't even involve time travel. I'm not totally against this concept and if you were going to make more Back to the Future movies back in the 90s, focusing on Doc and Marty exploring other sci-fi concepts is actually pretty interesting. I could get behind Doc and Marty exploring alternate dimensions or things like that. This is essentially what Rick and Morty is. And I'd be okay with the show becoming Back to the Future in title and legacy only in the later seasons, where we can just enjoy the characters in different science fiction scenarios. But all the concepts for the non-time travel related episodes are the stupidest ideas. Like in season 2 episode 6 Brave Lord and the Demon Monstrux, which involves Doc getting sucked into a video game and the monsters from the video game come out into the real world. This is not Back to the Future, come on. Then there's season 2 episode 7, The Money Tree, where Jules creates a money tree and becomes corrupted because being rich makes everyone greedy and evil. And then there's also season 2 episode 9, Hill Valley Brownout, which no, is not what you're thinking fellow fans of American Vandal, though that probably would have been better than the episode we actually got where Doc accidentally shuts off electricity to all of Hill Valley. Wowee, exciting stuff. I'm glad this kids cartoon is dealing with power cuts. It just seems so weird to me that if you're done with time travel, 
travel, the next concepts you immediately explore are something as bizarre and limiting as money trees and video game characters coming to life, which really border more on magic and fantasy than sci-fi, or something as dull and grounded as a power outage, which also isn't really even sci-fi. That's just science non-fiction. There's no on-brand middle ground here. We either betray the tone of the series, or we do something really boring. Still, I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy certain aspects of the show. There are some episodes that brush with what an optimum version of a Back to the Future cartoon would be, with some interesting concepts and creative ideas, and some of them maybe even would have made a half-decent fourth film. Maybe. Probably not. I'm, I'm glad it's a trilogy. In Season 2, Episode 8 of Vern by any other name, Vern travels back to the 1880s to try and convince his parents not to name him Vern because he thinks it's a dumb name. But he causes a rift between Doc and Clara and ends up having to nearly deliver himself as a baby when Clara goes into labour. But I don't think he'll get here in time. In time? In time for what? For the baby. To me, this is like a downsized, lower stakes version of the films. Vern's motivation is petty, sure, but he's a little kid, and it's still fundamentally about accidentally butterfly affecting your own birth, and the ending almost gets kinda heavy. It really felt like a shortened, child-friendly version of the plot structure of the classic trilogy. It's a good example of the spirit of Back to the Future if it were reduced to 22 minutes. In Season 1, Episode 8, Batter Up, Marty, Jules and Vern travel back to 1897 to help one of Marty's ancestors, Pee Wee McFly, achieve a successful career in baseball. This struck me as a slightly more nuanced episode as well, because 1897 isn't a particularly theatrical time period to travel back to, much in the way 1955 from the first film is more of a staging ground for a story about the characters, as opposed to the sequels which feel more about the genre pulp of their respective time periods, like 2015, which was the future, or 1885, which is the old west. This episode also had the whole helping out a relative angle, which is totally within the narrative language of Back to the Future. There's also some cool universe expanding stuff in the series which I appreciated. The characters now have both a DeLorean time machine and a train time machine. Which means one person can get saved by another person if they get lost in time without them. And if you were going to try make time travel safer, then it makes sense to build more than one time machine. One of the coolest scenes in the show though is in Season 1 Episode 11 Gone Fishing, where we see a mini flux capacitor, which Vern uses while inside a barrel going off the edge of a waterfall. The barrel is then repurposed as its own time machine as the flux capacitor is activated by the velocity of the barrel falling and reaching 88 miles per hour, meaning he doesn't fall to his death. Again, this is the kind of rare life or death high stakes creative stuff you see in the series, which actually would have been really cool to see in a film. This moment in particular is the closest the series gets to the lightning rod on the clock tower stuff from the first film. Anyway, while there are some shining lights in the Back to the Future animated series, I would ultimately regard it as a failed experiment. A true example of a forgotten pop cultural relic, where the fact that it exists is more interesting than the show itself, and the fact that I own it on DVD is way cooler than actually watching it. It's something I can display on my shelves so that when my friends come over they can look at it and be like, what? I didn't know this existed can we watch an episode and i can be like eh, that's not very good thank you so much for watching this video i hope you enjoyed it please leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts on the back to the future animated series please be sure to subscribe to the channel for more and thank you also to my patrons for supporting the channel the podcast and the videos head on over there yourself if you want to check it out